So this morning we're sitting with David Seymour, the leader of the ACT Party. Now you may not equate politics and entrepreneurship, but the performance of the ACT Party over the particular the last six years has been something that, sh- that I think is underpinned by probably grit and innovation. And that's why I want to talk with David Seymour today. So David, um, given you're one of the hardest workers in um, Parliament from the outside, um, thank you for carving out this time with me this morning. No, it's all right. Thanks for thinking of us, Gemma. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Um, so let's get started with your background in politics. What's um, what's your history there? Well, I'm a recovering electrical engineer, <laughs> um, and I'm also a philosophy grad. Um, and yet, a, a part of my sort of life story, such as there is one, is I've come from a family of, of business people that, that ran electrical contracting. My um, my grandfather's business. Uh, I grew up, you know, hearing stories about uh, changes in the copper price and the dollar, and um, you know, someone forgot to put the right oil in the digger that's on an atoll somewhere in the Pacific doing aid work, um, and you got a labour dispute and and so on. So, I've always, you know, had a sort of natural affinity for for business as a force for good. A lot of people in politics think that somehow business is a bit sinister. Um, I I don't see it that way. I see it as people coming together with different needs to satisfy those needs in a way they couldn't do alone. You've got your investors with your money, um, you've got your workers with time, um, and then you've got your customers with needs, and you've got your entrepreneurs with ideas. And those four types of people come together, you know, consensually, um, you know, because they can each end up better off than they would be alone. I think it's a beautiful thing. That's a really awesome way to start. (laughs) And so that's led you towards politics. Yeah, it's a funny paradox that, um, you know, what I try to do in politics is win political power um, so that I can use it as little as possible. So if you look at what most people do, um, they say, look, you know, you vote for me and I will give you um, those people's money. So not to, it's not a show about politics, but I'll just give you one recent example. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Greens are saying there is this little group of people who have too much money and if you vote for us, we'll take it and we'll give you 300 bucks a week, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, That's, you know, what they're doing is pretty blatant, but but most other parties do a version of that, usually a bit subtler. Um, And I think that's wrong because where it gets you is that the way to do well is to vote for people to give you money that other people have already made instead of actually go out and make money. Mm -hmm. Um, The other way that people get votes or the common way is those people over there are doing something you don't like. If you vote for me, I will make a rule to stop them, whether it's exploring for oil and gas or saying naughty things that, you know, should have hate speech laws over them or using plastic bags at the supermarket, whatever, you know. You, 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 and and I, I oppose that stuff because I think ultimately taking away other people's money and freedom makes us a, a less exciting, um, less interesting society with less creativity and less wealth because people just say, well, what's the point? You know, my options are taken away and even if I do... Uh, succeed, I'll, I'll, I'll be you know taxed um, and, and not get the benefit from it, or not to the extent I thought. Mm. Um, but of course it creates a big problem for a politician because you're running for parliament saying well I'm not going to give you other people's money and I'm not going to make rules that take away other people's freedom so that their behaviour better suits your sensibilities uh, so why would you vote for me? Um, and, and then you've got to start telling I think a more sophisticated story about how in a free society Uh, People are more likely to use their creativity so long as they have a certain level of security and certainty that they won't have it taken away from them. Um, And, you know, you get what's ultimately called human flourishing. Um, That's that's how I got into it um, because I I realised that, you know, any old fool can get elected promising other people's money. Lots of people do, but trying to get elected to, to create a freer society, that's a challenge that excites me. Thank you. Um, and so the ACT Party, when you got into politics, you opted to go and via the ACT 
Yeah, um, I guess ACT is the party that, you know, throughout its history has been closer to that political philosophy, that ACT doesn't really promise that it's going to, you know, give you other people's money or make lots of rules on other people. It, it says that we will make this a freer society. Um, so it was a was a natural fit, but it's fair to say that um, it was, you know, in some state of, of bother um, when I became the leader. And on that, for the benefit of the listener, I'm going to just cover off some of the um, results that you've achieved over the over the time. So you were elected in in 2014 with 0.69% of the vote, was it? Yeah, 0.69? although I wasn't the leader then, um, that Jamie White was, but that, that's true, I was elected then, yeah. Yes, and that's when you came in as the leader at that stage? Uh, yeah, well, after the election, I was elected to Parliament and Jamie wasn't, so therefore I, I became the leader at that point, yeah. Sure. And then 2017, 0.5%. Yeah, we didn't think it could get worse than 0.69, <laughs> but it turned out actually it could. And each time you retained a seat. That's right, yeah, and I'm very grateful to my neighbours and the Epsom electorate who um, have now elected me three times, um, and I, I hope they will again this year. Yeah, well, it seems like you're working pretty hard for that vote. Um, 2020, uh, 7.6%, and then currently you're looking at around... Uh, somewhere in the twelves. Um, yeah, as yeah. Most recent. Yeah, and you know we're we're really proud of that story of growth. We are aware that, um, as with any business, it's a combination of market conditions and what you yourself have done. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, you know, the fact that more and more people are disillusioned with the direction of New Zealand under Labor and National has been good for third parties. Mm. Um, but equally, um, you know, we're not the only smaller party around. And there's actually about a dozen, if you look at the, the number that are technically registered with the electoral roll. Um, you know, three of them are in Parliament beside Labor and National, and there's others that have been in Parliament a, a, in the past. Um, you know, we've become the, the market leader. We're ahead of the Greens. We're, you know, in all the recent polls, firmly cemented as the third best um, party and of course all of that can change, but but we're certainly you know aware of the context and the circumstances. But but it's not entirely that. It's also about some of the things that I'm proud we've done right too. Mm. And that's what I want to unpack a little bit more with you today because that's how it appears from the outside too. It's more than just um, you know you're getting good results. You know there's 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 the emphasis behind it from within the leadership team. So. Between 2014 and 2017, obviously that, that was a learning phase for you. And what were some of the most important lessons that you went through at that time? I think overall it was about how do we get our message across in a way that suits the customer. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, to some extent we were screwed whatever we did because the things that ACT went through from about 2009 to 2014, there was a series of um, scandals that would have been quite funny if only that happened to someone else. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we won't dwell on that. But, um, you know, one of the things I said after the 2017 election is, um, you know, the reputation and brand of the organisation mattered as much as the products it was selling. So I likened it to a shop that, you know, maybe had some quite interesting stuff on the shelf. I think by that time, 2017, we'd developed some good policies, some of which we still have and, and which are quite popular now. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth was, uh, nobody wanted to come into our shop because they thought it was a crappy shop that sold crappy stuff and they weren't really interested in spending the time to go inside and find out if that was still true. Um, so, you know, overall... It was about the, the brand and the reputation of the organisation. It started, you know, well below ground at a negative level um, in 2014. Um, and so gradually, you know, we got better at, at building the brand. Ultimately, that came in the form of changing the colour scheme and the logo and all that sort of thing. But the brand is not just a colour, a paint job. A brand is also um, how you behave and your values and so on. I think the other thing besides um, you know, rescuing the, the brand is that we had to start putting things in the sense that made sense to the voter. So you know, I'd come from a think tank. Um, ACT has always been a policy-heavy party, and we'd put out these detailed ideas and releases, um, and the voter was saying, well, that doesn't interest me, and we were saying, well, it should because it's important. Now, we may have been right at some technical level, um, but that's not how elections work. So the party of the market had to work out how to meet the market, and that's where I 
I think we've got a lot better. Reading helps. Um, you know, Kahneman and Tversky, Thinking Fast and Slow, is basically a compendium of two Israeli psych professors' works, um, behavioural psychology. And that really taught me a lot about why, you know, things are important to people if that's what they've chosen to believe, whether you like it or not. The classic example is voters practice wissiati, what you see is all there is. Um, so we learned that, you know, if, if you're not on the six o'clock news and they don't see you, um, then, you know, I guess it's not real. So, sorry, I'm so engrossed. <laughs> I've, um, right, and so then from 2017 to presently, you've been on this steady trajectory. So obviously you're, you know, you've touched on working on the brand and getting back to the basics. So how are you maintaining such a powerful momentum? Um, well, like I say, it's, it's a little bit of circumstance and a little bit of what we do um, and probably a little bit of luck. You know, one of the most successful people I've known in New Zealand um, is exceedingly wealthy and done amazing things and said, look, most of what's happened in my life has been luck. And I thought, man, most people in your position would assume it's because they're awesome. Um, now, I haven't achieved even 1% of what that guy had achieved, um, but I've always taken his lesson that a little bit of it's luck. So some of that, some of it's just circumstance, some of it's things we've done, the, the bit that we can control is the bit that we've done. So I think you know it's been about understanding um, what our organisation exists for, what our business exists for, and uh, you know I've always read, as I said at the beginning, business has been important to me. I've had an affinity for it. Um, I, I've read things like the E Myth by Michael Gerber, which is a really fantastic, very short book, um, which just points out, you know, you don't go into business to give yourself a job. Um, you already got a job. You someone else to do the management, someone else to do the entrepreneurship. You can be the technician. Um, and uh, of course, what I realised is that I might be an okay technician. I'd get good at going on TV and answering a question and selling a policy and shaking a hand and knocking on a door. And you know, being the the technical side of being a politician, I'd be quite quite good at one day. Maybe I, I try my best at it. Um, and, and then the question is, okay. That just creates a job for me, and I don't necessarily want a job. I want to make New Zealand a better place. I'm not particularly interested in being a politician myself. It's just what I do right now. Um, what I'm really interested about in is creating an act party that will outlive me, and that's where being the entrepreneur and being the manager becomes important. Uh, so, you know, according to to Gerber, you know, I've got to put in place processes and systems that will allow other people. Um, to do what I do, um, that you know, will will make them more productive um, as ACT MPs or ACT staff or volunteers or board members or members or donors or whatever. What is it about ACT that you get a better deal interacting with this organisation than with some other organisation? And that's about your organisation, your culture, your IP, and so on. So we do think about it in that sense, uh, like a business that raises people's productivity. At, the tasks that, that they have to perform. Uh, so look, reading's, reading's really important. I mean, you know, none of it's particularly surprising. Good to Great by Jim Collins. I mean, that idea of having a metric that you focus on. Um, and we've tried that. Uh, we haven't quite found something that you can measure um, because in, in politics you don't have sales, you don't have, I mean you have polling but even that's difficult to connect to any particular activity so we haven't quite nailed that but at least we got that way of thinking. Um, so look, I, I'm probably going on a bit now but, but we very much think about it as a business, it has to have a purpose and ultimately um, you know, I'm not trying to become a politician myself, I mean I, I do that because that's the job I had, but, but ultimately my job is to create an organisation bigger than me that can achieve the goals of a freer New Zealand. And how do you get the best of those around you uh, working towards that goal? Well, I think a lot of it is about the culture you create. I mean, for me, that goes back to a long time ago when I was coaching rugby. Um, what I found was that if you created a good environment that people enjoyed being in, um, and you know you didn't pull people down, and you you know look to emphasise the positive of what people were doing, and try and create a virtuous circle. 
What I found, I mean, I was coaching, you know, sort of 3B Auckland Secondary Schools rugby. So um, I was in 3B myself. So these are not people that are likely to become All Blacks um, <laughs> unless they have a very sudden uh, growth spurt and skills upgrade. Um, but nonetheless, um, a lot of players I play, I coached, um, were able to perform the most extraordinary feats on the field um, because they had confidence and because they were in an inter-supportive environment. Uh, and we've tried to do that for our MPs. I mean, you take nine people basically off the street, most of them thought they were completely safe and there was not a hope in hell. I mean, who would think that the ACT Party was going to elect um, you know, 10 MPs um, after it elected just one MP for three elections in a row. If you were number eight on that list, you'd think, no problem, I'll be safe. Um, <laughs> turns out they weren't. Um, so we've taken those folks off the street, and I think we've created an environment uh, where they can be productive. I think the other thing is just having a really clear sense of purpose. So, you know, we've got a one page that says, look, you know, our business is representation. We hear people's concerns and hopes, and we transform that into... Um, you know, a political action program or policy. Um, and the way we go about that is we're policy focused. We don't focus on other politicians, um, although a bit of that I think is inevitable in politics. Um, so these are the kinds of approaches uh, that, you, you know, are, are quite business-like, um, but really it's just about any organisation. Um, what else do we do? Um, you, you know, the way we structure our organisation is different. So most parties in parliament... Each MP is a sort of, you know, fully <laughs> autonomous entity and they'll get a budget and with that they can hire an, a, an EA who's usually a recent university grad or a middle-aged secretary and they go off down the corridor into their office and between the two of them they try and solve the problems of the world. And, and often you've got someone that hasn't had experience managing someone before, so it can go very wrong very quickly. And the parliamentary service, who's the nominal employer, often ends up sweeping up the mess. Um, what we did was we said, look, all of our 10 MPs are going to pool their budgets. We're going to hire one guy um, who's our chief of staff. He's going to be our service provider, and he's going to develop the caucus support centre um, so the caucus support centre is basically a group of people um, who do the research, the comms, the administration and, and, and uh, logistics, um, the, the outreach to, to go and visit and put on you know, events and stuff. Um, so the way we're structured, everyone's an open plan, everyone's using the same resources, um, and then if you've got nine new MPs, it's pretty clear you know, if someone needs help or whatever. So... Um, Clear purpose, um, you know, stru organisational structure, um, and uh, then we, you know, go away quarterly and do two days off-site um, with our team. And I think probably the most important thing about that, we go through some exercises that are a bit on the touchy-feely end with a facilitator who specialises in non-profit stuff and usually survive that. But I think the, the point of it is that it reminds our team that the other team members are human and that really changes your attitude away from some of the stuff that, like I look at that stuff in the greens, I mean, man, that's vicious. And I think they need to realise that the other people in their team actually are human and, and have more in common with their objective than, than you know, like the, act, the evil act party. But they seem, the thing about the Greens these days is I seem to like them more than they like each other. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's one of the, the points of those exercises we do is just remember that the remainders of your team are human. They were human before politics, human during politics. Um, and unless they die in office, they'll be human after politics. Um, and so um, one of the things that, that appears from the outside, you know, you, you're heavily um, engaging with the with the audience, whether it's voters, the other politicians. You, like you said before, if you can't see it, it's not there. And you and the party um, and Brooke as well are consistently front of mind. And I've also noticed that you've tailored your approaches across the different channels. So I follow your work across LinkedIn and Facebook, and the way that you approach the different platforms, I've noticed you modify the tone or the topic. Um, to connect in the way that the readers expect to see you on each of those platforms, you know, e yeah. entertainment versus education. Yeah, well, it's the old story, right? I mean, issues are issues if the voter says they're issues, mm -hmm. a.k.a. the customer's always right. Um, so, you, you know, if if you show up um, 
at a at a high school. I saw an MP recently at a high school rugby game, um, wearing a, a hat with a big logo of their political party. And I said, mm, oh, I didn't say anything, as I was like, you know, Napoleon said, don't interrupt your opponent when they're watching him making a mistake. But <laughs> but if I was going to say anything, I said, mate, this is so inappropriate. It's yeah, it's about the kids, about their rugby. You know, you're here because you presumably do actually care about this great event we're at. Um, and it's just, you know, oh, there's just so much wrong with that, right? So um, just like a, a physical or social space, um, it's important to the extent you can um, to make sure that you don't sort of look like an interloper. So if you're out doing, you know, gags on LinkedIn or you're trying to give business advice on Instagram, you know, you can quickly get in trouble. And look, I mean, no one's perfect at this. I mean, I got a whole lot of people piling on and, you know, um, beating the crap out of me for... Um, uh, you know, wearing a suit to visit a um, a poor guy who'd lost his house and been swept away by the, the Hawke's Bay mm. floods, Cyclone uh, Gabrielle. Um, and, you know, it's kind of interesting because um, the reason I was wearing a suit is that I, I travel light, so I'd been asked to give a speech in Hawke's Bay and I wore what I normally wear, and then I, while I had time, I said, I'll go out and visit some of these people being affected. Ironically, if I carried a suitcase and had a different change of clothes and got changed just to blend in, which would be less natural, but would, you know, people would decide that that, that was okay. Um, it's that funny old story, right? But um, I, I think it's, I guess the point of that is that it's important to be authentic because ultimately, you know, people get information so rapidly um, you've got to make sure that while you may uh, emphasise different things to different audiences, um, that underneath that you are real and authentic and you don't go out of your way to change your clothes every five minutes and so on. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you end up better off. Cause, so there's there's nothing wrong with talking about different things. I mean, if I go to a school, I talk about education policy. If yes. I, you know, if I go to a military base, we talk about defence policy, but as long as you don't tell them you have a totally different education policy while you're at the defence base, then that's okay. Yes. Yeah, you touched on authenticity, and that's something that on my way here I was I was considering because um, we live in a digital age where everything is so, you know, we, we can pull reports and stats from anywhere who our audience is and how to get the best out, you know. So we're, we're, we're talked at all the time. Everything's polished. It's hard to tell what's real. And so I think... I wanted to just say that authenticity can only come through consistency. And that's what, from my perspective, you guys are doing. You're consistently showing up, saying the, the same things, having very clear stances on stuff as well. Something that I've really appreciated about the party is we stand for or against this thing. Here's our, here's our line. Rather than trying to appease everybody saying, oh, you know, it's, we'd rather you didn't, but it's not that bad. But, oh, you know, and trying to cut the cake both ways. Um, and so, yeah, in the, in the age that we're in, authenticity is probably one of the th key things that's that's going to appeal to the hearts of people. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the digital age has, has really changed what politicians can get away with because the velocity of information is so much more rapid. Mm -hmm. Let's give you an example from the ACT Party 20 years ago. Um, you know, they, and this is a former MP, told me this, they had somebody went on the morning radio, really screwed up an interview, said something quite stupid. So then they're all just sitting there in the office at, you know, 10 o'clock saying, well, the next thing we need to think about is, you know, when we walk across what they call the bridge to get to Parliament, then the, the media have the opportunity um, to, to interview you. Now, um, you know, they're basically all sitting there with like six hours to work it out. Um, now you'd see people filing stories online every 30 minutes um, and the story can, by the by, by two o'clock, it's a totally different story mm -hmm. based on new info coming out. So, you know, because the velocity of information is faster, because people have more ways of finding out, uh, you actually have to be better um, at, um, at, at, or you, you, well, not better, you can't be better ultimately, you've got to be more real underneath. Um, you've got to have a better product, which is real, is what I'm trying to say. Um, otherwise, you know, you'll get found out, and, and people frequently do now. Mm. So taking a sidestep now, um, obviously there's a lot to it, and you've got a bigger team than ever, and you're potentially facing a new bigger team um, in a few months. So what are you doing for yourself so that you can bring your A game when you're, when you're on, when you're working? 
Um, look, I, I don't really, I feel like I'm in a good space. So people say, well, you know, what are you, well, what are you doing for yourself? I mean, you, you know, I like what I do. Um, I, I have a plan about how this thing um, ends and it, it will eventually because, you know, even if you become a dictator, you probably get shot by your own people. So um, <laughs> you know, all political careers end one way or another. Um, in, New, in New Zealand, they just get voted out and disgraced occasionally, which is much more humane. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel like what we're doing is, is worthwhile work. You know, I believe that New Zealand's policy settings are important to the quality of life that New Zealanders ultimately have. Um, and that the Policy Suggestions Act have would improve those settings and we've got to get out and, and sell it. So if you've got work that you like and you're in a pretty stable routine and you're getting enough sleep, then I think that's all you need. Mm. OK. And what is the secret source of the Act Party, in your view? Um, look, I don't think there is any secret. It's just um, a group of people who you know, probably have almost like a sort of fourth-form social studies view of how democracy is supposed to work, right? I mean, there's you know there's voters who have hopes and concerns, and there's politicians who listen to them, and then go away and design a solution and say, look, here's our solution. Do you like it? Um, and if they do, then they vote for you, and then you do your solution, and that's it. And I think that's probably you know quite an innocent version of politics, but I, I think it's where people want to be, and that's what I talked about before. You know, we got that one pager for the whole team. You know, we are in the representation business. We listen to people. We, you know, do good public policy, and we implement it. Um, and that's that's pretty much us. Um, so there, 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 if there is a secret sauce, it's a pretty simple recipe, um, and it, you could probably get it from fourth form social studies. <laughs> so. so where to from here for the Act Party? Well, you know, we're, we're going into a new phase now. So we've we've tried being a bigger organisation. Um, the people will decide if they want to make us bigger again. The current polls say they will, but these things can change. Um, you know, we may have we may face a scenario that we're, we're totally different from what we expect. But if we just focus on you know, what it looks like at sitting here right now, um, the net will be substantially bigger. There'll be you know sixteen, maybe more of us. So we'll get sixty percent growth. Um, a pretty decent chance that we'll be in government, so a number will actually move across to the Beehive and be in Cabinet, um, which is, you know, a lot of people don't realise this, but the difference between being in government and being in Parliament is is quite significant in terms of what you do day to day, what sort of resources you have, what sort of obligations you have. So even when you look at Parliament, they're all sitting in the same seats, basically, but, but some of them who are in government have quite a different role. Um, it's not like America where the Congress and the White House are like, you know, different buildings a kilometre apart, so you can really see that difference. Um, but if we end up with some people in government, then things will be a bit different for us. Um, and we will have to, again, grow and become more sophisticated and evolve our systems because, you know, it's one thing to do everything on a hypothetical level, which is really what you do in opposition, it's another thing that you're actually making decisions that, that have immediate and direct impacts on you know, millions of people's lives. So um, that's quite a big step up. Um, and obviously we you know, are, are very respectful of that challenge. On the other hand, um, we have made uh, a similar step up before, and I think that's been fairly successful so far, you know, touch wood. Um, uh, so that's, that's what you know, it means for us. It means we're going to have to redesign our systems, uh, we're going to have to bring on more people and getting good people is one of our real strengths because once you get some momentum, good people want to work with you and they don't want to leave, so then you, you know, which improves your quality and attracts more people. Um, so we're going to have to do that again. Getting good people is going to be a challenge. Um, and um, then, as I said, there's also just a little bit of luck. <laughs> you should always, <laughs> always factor in the possibility your luck won't be so good. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to uh, break that down with us this morning. Um, and I'll leave some links for the ACT Party so you can see what they're up to and what their important policies are at the moment. And all the very best for October. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.